Anyway, Numbers 24, 15 through 19. And he, Balaam, took up his discourse and said, The oracle of Balaam, the son of Beor, the oracle of the man whose eye is open, the oracle of him who hears the words of God and knows the knowledge of the Most High, who sees the vision of the Almighty falling down with his eyes uncovered. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. It shall crush the forehead of Moab and break down all the sons of Sheth. Edom shall be dispossessed. Seir also, his enemies shall be dispossessed. Israel is doing valiantly. And one from Jacob shall exercise dominion and destroy the survivor of the cities. Let's pray and we'll keep going. Lord, these are seemingly harsh words for us. Lord, help us to see the true reality in Christmas, that we are either one or the other. We are either on board with your purpose for Christmas. We are either loving the purpose for which you send Jesus into the world, grateful for this Messiah. We are either enthroning him as the king of our hearts, or we are hating him and enemies of him, and will be destroyed by him when he comes back. There's no in-between here. Let Christmas be a call to us, a reminder to us, the serious nature of our sin, and the gracious, amazing grace. You came and did something about it. Open these realities to our hearts and minds tonight, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. The title of this message is Enthroned Indeed. And it's the final message in this holiday message series, unpacking the beloved Christmas song, What Child Is This? The last stanza in this famous song goes like this. So bring him incense, gold, and myrrh. Come peasant king to own him. The king of kings salvation brings. Let loving hearts enthrone him. And with that call, we are confronted with the contrast that I began talking about last week when I made a deliberately jarring statement that there's a difference between those who love the true reason for the season from those who only love the holiday, that those who merely love the holiday actually have a diabolical and murderous hatred for Jesus Christ and for the true meaning of Christmas. I began to set up this contrast by focusing on the beautiful and positive aspect of the Christian who sees who Jesus is, son of God, come into the world to save sinners and then hastes to bring him praise. The ones who would celebrate the Christmas season all to the praise and glory of God, all for the ever-increasing fame of Jesus Christ. I wanted to point out this aspect of the Christian who would even live out all of his life to bring the newborn king honor, glory, and praise. The Bible gives us a precedent for this. Out of the two people in our contrast, there's two, no in-betweens. Out of the two people in our contrast, there are precedents for both. But out of the two, for the first person in our contrast, we have a precedent in the stories of the shepherds and in the wise men who each in their way dropped everything and they hastened to the place where they, where they would find the Christ child and worship him and adore him as he always ought to be by all. And in the series finale tonight, we are going to look at the other side of this contrast, a precedent for my statement about the diabolical and murderous hatred of Jesus Christ and hatred of for the true meaning of Christmas. This message is going to focus on King Herod in the story from Matthew 2 and provide the second precedent, a precedent for that alarming and jarring statement, so that both you and I, by the end of this message tonight, should clearly see the difference between those who come under the grace of God at Christmas from those who would kill the infant Jesus in his bed. It sounds negative and harsh, doesn't it? And I deliberately stayed away from that attitude last week, and I said it's because it's Christmas. Because it's Christmas, like that sort of stuff is too negative and it's too harsh for Christmas. But at this point in the season, guys, there's too much at stake. There's too much at stake from, for some here, for some of you guys here, or for some people who are in your life perhaps, there's far too much at stake. Your eternal soul is at stake. So Christmas time, especially the days immediately prior to Christmas itself, is no time to back off. It's no time to sugarcoat anything. Peace on earth and goodwill to men has a terrible counteractive element to it for those remaining in darkness, for those who are hating the light that's come into this world as Jesus Christ at Christmas. And this terrible counteractive element is Jesus Christ coming in judgment, and it's as real in human future as the infant Jesus is in human history. 
For that reason, we're asking, what child is this? One day, he, that child, this same child, will come to judge the living and the dead. One day, if he'll return from his throne in heaven, riding on a white horse, he's going to enter our realm as king of kings. He's going to enter our realm as Lord of lords to reign forever and ever. And the sword of his word will bring recompense upon all the deeds of men in perfect and terrible justice and holy and righteous wrath. So the title of this message is Enthroned Indeed. In the series, we've been asking the question, what child is this? We really think about this child laying in that manger. What child is this? When it comes to that, nobody is confused as to the nature of the baby born at Christmas. The Christmas holiday and traditional Christmas celebrations have seen to that. The entire world celebrates Christmas. And no matter what we want Christmas for, there is no question at all as to what the real purpose for Christmas is. And when people ignore the true meaning of Christmas and they celebrate the holiday for silly or sentimental reasons alone, they don't do it unknowingly. They don't do it unknowingly, as though they thought that was all it is. As though reindeer, snowmen, and Santa and sleigh rides is, is all it is. No. Nobody believes that. Everyone knows what Christmas is. Everyone knows what the true purpose of Christmas is. Everyone knows that the true meaning of Christmas is about the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who came to take away our sins by dying on a cross, that he was raised from the dead to raise us and bring us with him to God. Everyone knows what child this is. Everyone. It's more of a matter of whether or not we care about that. We know it, don't we? We all either love it or we hate it, and there is no in-between. Too strong? Maybe some people tolerate it. Maybe they ignore it. Maybe they just forget. Maybe they forget about that, but no one would ever say they hate it, right? Rob, you're being too strong with your language. But the Bible is clear. No one can love two masters. No one. You will love the one, and you'll hate the other. What What does that have to do with Christmas? You'll love one master and hate the other. Why am I using that verse? Some people find Christmas offensive. You hear it all the time. Some find Christmas offensive, that it forces a religion on others in an unwelcomed way. Whoops. Sorry. So we insist on saying happy holidays instead, because holidays can mean whatever you want it to mean. It can mean that we love that winter is here. Not likely, but it can mean that we love that winter is here. It means that we're getting a break from school for a few weeks that it's getting close to New Year. It could mean Hanukkah. It could mean Christmas or whatever. It doesn't even matter doesn't. Happy holidays. I wish you whatever you want for yourself this season. That's what we're really saying whenever we greet one another that way. Happy holidays. I wish you whatever you want for yourself. But Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas means we acknowledge for ourselves and very much wish for others that we find our greatest joy, that we find our greatest happiness in the reality of God. We say Merry Christmas because we are deeply blessed by this gospel and we're moved off into tears, aren't we, Christian, by the true meaning of Christmas. Merry indeed. How great our joy when what we love about Christmas is the true meaning of his coming. What a joy that we can one day see God face to face because our sins are forgiven in Christ and we are raised with him to sit in heavenly places with Christ and are given new and redeemed natures that love God and see God his glory through his son, our savior, Jesus Christ. So Merry Christmas, we say. Merry Christmas. And hopefully, Christian, that's what we all mean when we say that. But on the other hand, when God's purpose for Christmas is to reconcile sinners to himself, we sinners take that to mean and we demand that he means to relent, to relent about the whole sin thing and just declare a truce. Peace on earth, goodwill to men. Peace on earth, goodwill to men, after all, that that it doesn't matter anymore. Sin doesn't matter anymore. The commandments of God don't matter anymore. We insist, don't we, that God's intentions in sending Christ is to relent and let us enthrone ourselves our own way, to tolerate and validate us, and to support our own versions of what a glorious kingdom for ourselves must mean for us. According to the world, lying in sin and error, pining the only good intention God could ever have in sending Jesus Christ at Christmas is to relent, to unconditionally bless everyone, to give everyone the gift of themselves exactly how they want to be. Yet we know from the Bible that if we mean to celebrate Christmas the way the word itself suggests, then Christmas is a gift to us of himself, of Jesus Christ himself, and not the gift of ourselves 
at all. And such a gift of God from God demands that we examine ourselves, that we examine our hearts and our motivations and our intentions, and we relent. We relent. Christmas demands that we find ourselves so sinful that God's own son would have to come in mean estate, be made like us, and then be pierced by nails and spear bearing the cross for our sin. So to be offended by this incredibly gracious action of God is to reject his grace. Being offended by Christmas denies our own condition of sinfulness and consciously hates God for saying such things about us. Therefore, being offended at such things as Christmas leads to hatred for Jesus Christ himself and hatred for his coming at Christmas. Why? That's some pretty strong language. Why am I saying that? It's because it's judgmental. This forces us all to acknowledge God as righteous and just in all his judgments. We really are under his authority. and We really are accountable to his moral code, his holy moral code. We really are most certainly guilty of sin according to it. And we really are rebellious against him as our true and rightful king. That's why we hate. That's why we hate Christmas. Hatred for him and for his Christ exists in every heart that hesitates to love him and to enthrone him. And yet, thanks to Christmas, no one can claim that they didn't know. I, I didn't know that's what it was about. I had no idea that it was about my sin. I had no idea it was about a savior. Thanks to Christmas, no one can claim they didn't know. They might not care, but everyone knows, thanks to Christmas, that the Son of God came into the world to save sinners Everyone knows that's him laying in that stable manger. Everyone. Nobody's confused about that. Nobody is, and neither was Herod. When the wise men came to Herod looking for the newborn king, the Bible says that Herod was troubled. It says he was troubled, and so was all of Jerusalem. And Herod asked the priests and he asked the scribes, where is this Christ child supposed to be born? And they quoted the prophecy from Micah 5, which said, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Meaning, where do they know where to find him? Bethlehem. So Herod knew. He knew that the child the wise men came to find and worship was the long-expected Messiah. He knew that. So did all of Jerusalem. The wise men dropped everything to find Jesus and worship him. The shepherds left the sheep in the field to find Jesus to worship him, and they went to tell everyone what they had seen, the first evangelists. They went to tell everyone, what child is this? This is the Messiah. There is no question about it. They knew, and Herod knew too, and Herod believed it just like they did. But Herod wasn't about to worship Jesus. No, Herod wanted him dead. With a murderous hatred, Herod lied to the wise men, claiming that he too wanted to find Jesus and worship him as they did. What good news they must have thought. Well, that's great news for King Herod to rejoice at the coming of the Messiah. Look at us. We're all celebrating Christmas together, right? We all believe the same thing together, right? That's great. But Herod lied. Think about our own hearts here for a second. Herod lied, acting like he was on board with the true purpose of Christmas. He lied. He wasn't thrilled with the news of God's redemption. He didn't want the reality of Christ's coming. All Herod wanted was the throne he wanted the throne. If the coming of Jesus Christ means, if it means what he'd heard it means, that for the Christ to come in his time, he would have to step aside so that the Messiah could take the throne of Israel instead of Herod. That's what he thought. After all, from Isaiah, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, not Herod's. It's going to be over for you, Herod. It shall be on his shoulders. And his name shall be called my Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father and Prince of Peace, and not Herod. <laughs> not Herod. Of the increase of his government, not Herod's government, of the increase of his government, and of peace there will be no end. And on the throne of David and over his kingdom, not Herod's kingdom, to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. Herod might have loved this prophecy as much as anyone else did in, when, there, when he was with everybody else, celebrating the future Christmas along with everybody else, like we celebrate the past Christmas with everybody else, right? Israel will be redeemed. Israel will be reconciled to God. God himself will reign as king. That's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But someday, not today. I want Christ to be king as much as the next guy does. Someday. But today I'm king. 
And I want to stay king. I want Christ to be king, sure, just not my king. Christmas calls us. Let loving hearts enthrone him. Let loving hearts enthrone him. How do you feel about stepping aside from being ruler over your own heart's kingdom? How do you feel about submitting your desire and your lives to Jesus Christ forever? Maybe you feel more like Herod today than, you, than those shepherds and wise men who dropped everything. Maybe you feel more like Herod. If so, beware. Herod might never have thought himself as a murderer before, let alone killing children in their cribs. No way. Never do that. And as I say that, there is no in-between, that you either love this purpose of Christmas and you love the Christ of Christmas, or you hate him and wish him dead. If you think that's harsh, Herod might have thought the same thing. There's no way. There's no way I would hate that way. Until, until the coming of this newborn king means stepping aside. Until it means submitting to the will of God. Until it means living for the glory and praise of Jesus. Until it means dethroning me. The call was to haste to bring Jesus praise like the wise men did. Herod hasted all right, but not to bring the baby laud. Quite the contrary. Herod hasted to go on one of the most horrific killing sprees in world history. In savage and desperate attempt to rid his kingdom of this Christ, he viciously murdered every male baby that lived anywhere in and around Bethlehem, ripped them from their mother's arms. No one is king but me. And so this is the precedent in scripture for that alarming thing that I said, that you either haste to praise Jesus, who's come on Christmas Day, or you hate Jesus and his coming on Christmas Day. Hate him with a diabolical and murderous hatred. There is no in-between. Are we any different than Herod on our own? Are we any different than Herod? You think so? Maybe it seems so at first, but if you love your throne where you sit as the ruler of you and you are the sole desire of your own heart and you will not yield your heart to God or his son or our savior, Jesus Christ, then you will find that you are not so different from Herod after all. Like Herod, we love to sit enthroned over our own hearts and lives, don't we? Look at the lengths we'll go to doing everything we can, believing and validating everything that we can to keep ourselves enthroned as far as we're concerned. Look at our social media activity. Look at our internet search history. Look at how we consume other people for our own purposes and our own pleasure. Look how we spend our money. Look at our attitudes towards our parents, our teachers and leaders. Listen to what we say about other people behind their backs. Look at the rules and laws we disregard and disobey, expectations that are on us from those in authority over us. No way. I have the right to disobey. Who are you to presume authority over me? And who are you, O oh Christ, to presume to judge me? And look how we scoff at Christianity. Even if you claim to be Christian, do you defend it? Do you defend Christianity? Do you publicly bear his scorn along with him? Do you proclaim his great salvation, the salvation he died on a cross to bring? Do you proclaim it? Why not? Why not? Why is it so easy to go along with those who mock everything Christianity claims to be about? Why? It's because it's the, it's the laughing stock in our society today. Why is that? Because it demands that we submit to a supreme and sovereign moral authority, like bowing to a king, like pledging our hearts and lives to a king, namely Jesus Christ, to live according to his commandments. How silly. How silly, how intolerant, how archaic, how judgmental, how hateful, how narrow-minded. Coexist instead, we say. Every belief is valid. Every expression is right. When it really comes down to it, in order to remain enthroned over our own hearts and lives, guys like Herod, we even kill babies. We kill babies. We cut them to pieces. We dismember them without mercy and suck them out of their moms by the millions. Why? Long live the king. Guys, as long as that king is me, my heart will justify anything. Anything. Herod wasn't confused about Christmas. What child is this? He was not confused as to the identity of this child. What child is this? What child indeed Herod knew? And so do you. 
So do you. Nobody's confused about Christmas. Nobody. We're not confused about Christ's purpose in his coming. We're not confused by such mean esteem. We're not confused by his condescendence. Not anymore. Christmas has seen to that. It's been cherished for centuries. It's taken away our excuses. Anyone who loves the holidays knows you love it or you hate it because the true meaning of Christmas means that we have to step aside. Christmas means that a king has come from God to man to live amongst us. An end has come to our own rule over our own heart's throne. And here we are answering the song, what child is this? This baby is Christ and he is the king. And you either love him as your Lord and Savior or for the sake of keeping yourself on your own pathetic throne, you hate him. And there is no in between. What sin would you refuse to recant? What sense of yourself do you insist on enthroning? What would you murder this Christ child over? If you don't love the true meaning of Christmas, then there's ultimately going to be something. What would you murder this Christ child over? Or by the grace of God, do you see his coming the way it means to be for his people, the way it was meant to be? It's the new and glorious morn and the long expected end to sin and error pining. If that's what Christmas is to you, then rejoice, Christian, because we are disgraceful and destructive kings, aren't we? Taking the very image, the royal, priestly, and majestic image of God that we're created in and marring it beyond all recognition. Taking our egotistic kingdom of pride and self-worship, destroying ourselves with it and consuming and using everyone else we ever managed to be Lord over. We do that, don't we? Praise God that he's come. And for everyone else, when Christmas calls you to Christ, and it does, Christmas calls you to Christ right this second, it does. When Christmas calls you to see this child laying in mean estate, having come from God and his God and is lying in a stable manger because you've sinned, because you'll die in hell forever without him, will you step aside from the throne of your doomed and wretched heart and enthrone him? Enthrone him. You know his story. Christmas has seen to it that you know his story. He died on a cross for your sins, and one day every knee will bow. It's only a matter of time. And one day every tongue will confess a Christmas song to the glory of God the Father. We sang it tonight. Christ is the Lord. Oh, praise his name forever. His power, his glory evermore shall reign. And the terrible counteractive reality is that if you insist on sitting as king and Lord on your own pathetic heart throne, you're going to find that the peace and goodwill to men he came to bring is only for those who come to know their need of him. And this great and terrible king, full of glory and grace, but also full of justice and wrath, is not at peace with you. You who would compete for yourself against him. And all you rule will pass away with you. What a waste. Repent. Turn from your own sinful rule over your life and turn to God so that by his coming and by his dying, your sins may be blotted out. Nails, spear shall pierce him through the cross. Be born for me, for you. Hail the word made flesh. Hail him as king, the king of kings salvation brings. But loving hearts enthrone him because whether you want him or not, he is enthroned indeed. Heavenly Father, I can't think of anything more serious that you've done in this world, anything more judgmental against us in our sin than to send this Christ, than to send this baby. You're telling us in this manger nativity scene what it takes. You're telling us that it takes you coming in flesh to rescue us. Lord, may every heart here tonight prepare you room. May we join the triumph of the skies as we think of this awesome reality this awesome incarnation, this awesome rescue mission. Let Christmas never bounce off the side of our head again. Let it never be about only silly and sentimental stuff again. Lord, through your word that we're reminded of in these awesome Christmas songs, may Christmas become more sacred than we ever imagined it would so that we may tell others what you've done, that as we grow older and have children of our own, that it's not just for the kids, this isn't just a holiday for the kids. This isn't just about family. This is for our eternal soul. And may we enthrone you, Jesus, even tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.